to understand that, to know that that is indeed truth. We, we moved on and we talked about several other things like Palm Sunday, that, that week prior to Resurrection Sunday. We talked about the waving of the palms and the triumphal entry when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. We talked about the people, why they were celebrating, why they were shouting, what they were shouting, the significance of it, and what it meant at that time. Why, for that moment, the people were ready to give Jesus the praise that He deserved all along. We explored that. Some of us even examined the other various events of of Holy Week, that week just prior to Easter, the telling of the parables, the cleansing of the temple, the Last Supper, the time in the garden, reviewed all those different things. And then on Good Friday, we gathered together here and we had a Good Friday service. We had prayer and praise and we worshiped the Lord and we shared communion together and we remembered what He did for us so many years ago. And then, of course, last week, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday. We sang about it. We talked about it. We celebrated it. We listened to testimonies about what Jesus has done in different people's lives and what that cross represents. And then later that day, I'm willing to guess that most of us went somewhere, gathered with somebody, spent time with others, and we shared a meal together. And we had a wonderful time of, of, of fellowship, but we had food and we ate together and most likely we went home and complained about eating too much. I know I did. How different things are today than they were 2,000 years ago? Or are they? This morning I'm going to look at a couple of events that took place on Resurrection Sunday. After the resurrection. Things that took place a little later that same day. See, Jesus rose, yes, but that wasn't the end of it. He continued to minister. He continued to teach. He continued to reach out to people, to meet with people, to talk with people, to comfort people. Later that same day, ministry went on. Teaching went on. Let's look at a few things this morning. First of all, Jesus was walking side by side with people that same day. If you look at Luke 24, verses 13 through 35, we're not going to read them all this morning, don't worry. You don't have to listen to me read all those verses. But in Luke 24, those verses tell of two men walking from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus. They walked on the road together. And as they walked down that road, they started talking about the events that had just occurred over that weekend. Everything that had happened, everything that was going on, they shared with each other, they talked with each other, they even discussed their disappointment with each other. I think it's important to understand that word disappointment there for a minute. You think, this is Resurrection Sunday. Jesus just rode from the dead. How could they possibly be disappointed? Because they walked away realizing that things didn't go exactly as they had planned. Things were not what they thought they were going to be. They were not what they expected them to be. Again, if you'll remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about this. Those waving those palm branches, those celebrating as Jesus rode into town, they were doing so because they thought that Jesus was coming to deliver them from Rome. They were looking at a short-sighted deliverance. This immediate, this instant deliverance from the Roman government. They weren't thinking about salvation or long-term deliverance in their life. These two were no different. They were walking away disappointed, thinking that things didn't work out just as they had desired them to. As they were walking along that road on their way to Emmaus, who should come walking up next to them but Jesus? Jesus. He comes up and walks the road with them. He walks up to them and He says, what are you guys talking about? 
And Scripture tells us that these two did not recognize Jesus. They're on the road, walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Jesus comes up and walks next to them, and they don't recognize Him. So when Jesus says, what are you talking about? These guys are, in their minds, they're going, how could anybody possibly be in this area and not know what has just happened over the last few days? So they kind of look at Him in a little bit of disbelief that He didn't know what was going on or what was happening. So Jesus says something else to them, and I absolutely love this part of the text, this part of the Scripture. Jesus looks at them and says, well, why don't you tell me about what's been happening? Jesus asked them to fill him in on his own life. I just find that very interesting. So the two decide that they're going to give the cliff note version of of what happens or what had happened. This was a prophet. We really had hoped he was our deliverer. They crucified him. And now some people are even saying he's back alive and he's not really dead. So Jesus hears them kind of give this quick example, this quick story of what's happened. And he responds this way in Luke 24, verses 25 and 26. He says, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Scripture even says he he went on to continue to talk to them and explain to them everything the prophets had said regarding himself. And guess what? These two still did not recognize that it was Jesus walking next to them. Several weeks ago, we, we, we talked about things we never want to hear. And this kind of reminds me of one of those things. We read a portion of Scripture in Matthew where Jesus says to His disciples, Are you still so dull? Here He is, the risen Savior, walking next to them, and they don't recognize Him. How could that be? It wasn't until later that same day when they sat down together at the table And Jesus broke bread before them and gave thanks and was giving them the bread that they finally recognized who this man was. Luke 24, 30 and 31. When He was at the table with them, He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized Him and He disappeared from their sight. See, it was at the intimacy of that table. It was at the intimacy of that time of dinner, that that breaking of bread together, that their eyes were opened and they finally realized it was their risen Savior with them the whole time. Their response is priceless. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us on the road and opened the Scriptures to us? They were questioning themselves, how could we not have recognized our Savior walking with us? On that very day of His resurrection, these two men who were expecting Jesus to deliver them from Rome didn't even recognize Him walking next to them on the road to Emmaus. Not until they had that intimate, personal encounter with Him, then their eyes were opened. Then they realized who it was. Then they decided we have to go tell everybody about this. And Scripture records that they went off and said, it's true, it's true, the Lord has risen. At that point, they finally believed it. Now, I do want to be fair about this. There is a verse in this text that we have to look at as well. Verse 16 of chapter 24 says, but they were kept from recognizing Him. They were kept from recognizing Him. Why were they kept from recognizing Him? I don't have a clue. Scripture doesn't give out the detail as to why they were kept from recognizing Him. It just simply says that they were. It does appear though that they were for some reason kept from recognizing Him until that intimacy of breaking bread together at that table. When they shared together that bread, when He gave thanks and said, 
this is the bread. I'm not sure what he said there, but when he said to them, here's the bread, their eyes were open, and at that moment they recognized him. Now if we look back at this this whole event, there's a lot of things that we can apply to ourselves in our own lives today. Let me give you a few examples of this. How many times do we get disappointed that things don't go the way we expect them to? We have our agenda, we have our thoughts, we have our desires, we have our focus. And when things don't line up with that, do we shout praise? No. We get disappointed. We get frustrated. We have our concept of what's supposed to happen and how it's supposed to happen. And when it doesn't go that way, what do we do? We walk away. We leave. We walk away. These two on the road to Emmaus, they were walking away. Walking away from the center of everything that just happened, this this wonderful resurrection that just occurred, they were walking away. Now, I, I'm pretty much, I think I can guarantee you that they were not going off to tell other people that he was alive. They were walking away because they were disappointed. Because things didn't go as they expected it to go. It wasn't according to their plan. You know, the simple fact that they were just walking away is something we need to even take a look at. It tells us later in Scripture, and we'll get to this in a minute, but the the eleven, the disciples, they gathered together in a room. They at least were going to talk to each other, encourage each other, comfort each other about what had just taken place, discuss it with each other. These two weren't even to do that. They just walked away in the opposite direction of everything else that was going on. They were not even interested in talking to their brothers about what had just happened. They weren't even interested in getting somebody else's input or discussion or or whatever. They just walked away in disappointment. How many times in our lives do we walk away? Out of disappointment, out of frustration, whatever the reason, how many times do we turn our backs and walk away? Usually it's because things aren't going the way we want them to go. Because things aren't happening the way we want them to happen. In this case, everyone else was gathering together and they walked in the opposite direction, unwilling to even talk to their brothers about it. And then, of course, you can't miss, what about the fact that they didn't recognize Jesus? Uh, Let me again remind you, He was walking right next to them this wasn't a, a vision or, or, or whatever you, an apparition, whatever you want to call it. He, as a man, was walking right next to them on the road. Now again, in fairness, Scripture says they were kept from recognizing them. Recognizing Him, excuse me. But how many times is Jesus walking right next to us? Talking to us? Filling us in on Scripture and we don't even recognize Him? How many times does that happen in our life, in our journey? Do we have our spiritual blinders on? For what reason can we not recognize Him walking right next to us? How can we hear His voice and not have a clue that it's Him? You know, when we do finally stop moving, when we, when we do finally sit still for a moment, when we do finally have some sort of intimate fellowship with Him, when we choose to break bread with Him, so to speak, then our eyes are opened. Then we begin to see. Then it becomes clear and we understand that it's Jesus that's with us. That's giving us wisdom, direction, discernment. That's walking right next to us. And perhaps, perhaps maybe, when that light goes on and our eyes are open, maybe we could even say the same thing these two did. Were not our hearts burning within us? How could we not realize that it was Jesus walking with us all that time? 
when it does finally click and are finally open, do we respond the way these two responded? Do we immediately get up and go tell others what Jesus has done for us? That's what these two did. When their eyes were opened, when they realized it was Jesus, they decided it was time to give Him credit, the credit that was due to Him. They left where they were. They went back to Jerusalem and they were going to tell everybody that He is truly alive. They got up. They returned. They went back to meet with the disciples and they shared with them what Jesus had shown them. They had just walked seven or so miles in one direction. They were willing to turn around and go right back that seven miles so that they could tell that Jesus was alive. Do we do anything remotely close to that? When the Lord shows us something, when the Lord reveals something to us, when He blesses us, when He teaches us something, when He opens our eyes, do we turn around and go tell others what He's done for us? Do we share that testimony? You know, believe it or not, that's an encouragement to others. That's an encouragement. Testifying is important. I'm sure the disciples were eager to hear the fact that he had, they had just walked, walked with Jesus. They had just talked with Him. There was no question that He was still alive. Do we do that same thing? When Jesus does something amazing in our lives, Luke 24.33 says they got up, they returned at once to Jerusalem, they went and spent the time with the disciples to tell them that indeed He is alive. They went back to tell everyone what He had done for them. When the truth is revealed, do we do the same thing? And you know, when you read through that whole passage, I see it with genuine excitement. It wasn't a, oh man, we've got to go back now and tell everybody we were wrong. There was excitement there. They were ready to go back. They were ready to testify. They were ready to share what Jesus had done for them. There was excitement in the whole experience. Let's go on to the second thing because this event leads right into that second event that occurred later that same day. Number two, the disciples hid in fear. The disciples hid in fear. If you continue reading in Luke 24, it goes on to tell us that the two that were on the road to Emmaus went back, shared with the disciples, and talked to them while they were gathering in that upper room. John chapter 20 also records this particular event of the disciples being together in that room. And it's a little shorter version, but he gives some very specific words as John writes 2019. On the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked, For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. The doors were locked. And Scripture very plainly says why they were locked. They were locked out of fear. Out of fear. Jesus had just defeated death. Jesus just rose from the grave. And the disciples hid in fear. They weren't celebrating. They weren't doing the victory dance. They were hiding in fear. What was that fear? Fear of the Jews? Fear that the Pharisees would come after them next because they were a follower of Jesus? Fear to admit that they knew who Jesus was because they didn't want to suffer the same way that Jesus had just suffered? Fear even that they would have been accused of stealing Jesus' body from the tomb. We know that that is an accusation that that, uh, went around after Jesus' resurrection. In fact, some still talk about that today. That the disciples took His body. Were they afraid that they were going to be accused of that? Whatever it was, the fear was driving them to hide. But I want you to look at something. No fear could ever stop Jesus from finding them. No fear could ever stop Him from gathering together with them. The doors may have been locked. They even could have been barricaded for all we know. But nothing would have been enough to keep Jesus out. 
even in the midst of their fear, Jesus came to comfort them, to encourage them. Both Luke and John record in their Gospel the first words that Jesus spoke when He walked into that locked room. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Those words, as comforting as they might seem, were not even enough for the disciples. They continued to doubt. They continued to question. Jesus had to say to them, look at me. Look at, I have hands. I have bones. It's me. I'm here in flesh. I'm not a ghost. And He even asked for something to eat. And He ate in front of them. Again, to show to them, this is really me. It's me who's here. And we get to verse 45 of chapter 24 in Luke's Gospel. And we read, Then He opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. At that moment, a transformation took place. They went from cowering in fear to having their minds opened to the Scripture. They were transformed. They were changed. They were no longer afraid, but they were able to understand Scripture and what Jesus had just done for them. If you go back and read in the Gospel of John where I said this, this account is also listed, it talks about a second time that Jesus appeared to all of His disciples. And if you'll remember the first time, Thomas wasn't there. So He meets them again. This time Thomas is there. Uh, Thomas, you know, he wants to make sure that Jesus is really alive because he didn't believe everybody telling them. And this time it says the disciples were also in a room behind a locked door. But guess what? There is no mention of fear whatsoever. They might have still been in a locked room, but there was no fear present in that statement at all. The fear was gone. Their minds were open. Jesus became their source of strength and encouragement from that time on. Here we are 2,000 years later. And i got to tell you, some of us in some ways still live in fear like the disciples did. They feared Roman rule. They feared being persecuted. They even feared their fellow Jew. They feared what others might think. And i got to be honest, today, some of us are bound by that same type of fear. Sure, we call ourselves Christians. Sure, we act like Christians when we're with other Christians. But when we go home, we lock the door, we close it, we hope nobody is ever going to find out who we really are. We get afraid of what other people are going to think of us. We are afraid of sharing our testimony. We are afraid of what others might say about us or what they might say to us. We fear what they, that they might not like us anymore. In fact, it's sad to say, but in a lot of ways, we find it easier to deny Him like Peter did than we do to stand up and confess that we love Him, that He's our Savior and what He has done for us. The good news is that even today, so many years later, Jesus will still come through that locked door. He will still find you. He will still help you. He will still set you free. He will still comfort you. He will still deliver you from whatever it is that's holding you back. And He will still say to you today, peace be with you. There's no need for you to fear. There's no need for you to worry. He's still willing to open your mind, open your eyes, open your hearts, and encourage you just as He did then. You see, all those years ago, on that very day that He rose from the dead, Jesus walked with people. He walked alongside of them. 
right next to them because he wanted to encourage them, because he wanted to comfort them. He, he explained Scripture to them. He calmed their fears. He opened their eyes because they were spiritually blind. He opened the hearts of His closest friends, the disciples, so that they could understand Scripture. Today, He does the exact same thing for you and I. The same thing that He did later that day, later Resurrection Sunday. That very day, He walked with people. He encouraged people. He does the same thing today. Side by side, He walks with us. And He will never abandon us or leave us. Today, He helps us to understand Scripture and what Scripture means. Today, He is continually opening the eyes, the spiritual eyes, mind, and heart of people all around us and of us. He continues to encourage us and help us to understand Scripture as it is written. And He continues to this very day to set us free. Free from fear, Free from every other thing that might be hindering us or binding us or or holding us back. What He started then, that afternoon, that evening, He continues to this very day. This very hour this morning. Anyone and everyone who calls on His name can experience the exact same thing that they experienced later that day, 2,000 plus years ago. There's only one thing you got to do. Surrender. Surrender to Him. As we learn to surrender our lives, as we learn to let go of, of the world and all that it offers, we can experience the exact same thing they experienced that day. Pastor Brian's going to come up. He's going to lead us this morning. We're going to lift our voice to him. But I'm going to encourage you this morning. If you haven't surrendered to him at all, or if you're feeling like you're one of those ones who have walked away, today is the day to surrender. Today is the day to say, Lord, help me to see you walking next to me. Help me to know that you are there. Open my mind, my eyes, my heart so that I can understand what you're teaching me. Today is the day. We're going to stand. We're going to lift our voices. And as we do, if you need to surrender, there's where you need to do it. At the altar, before the Lord.